All right, so range types and why uh, I'm going to try to transform your life in the next uh, 40 minutes. So what's a range? Um, I think we're all pretty familiar with them. It could be you know, a range of numbers. It could be you know, a, range, you know, a range of prices. You know, basically, it's an ordered list that extends from you know, point A to point B, and you know exactly how to get there. You know, and it's something we see, we see them all the time. You know, when we're doing schedules, when you're doing, working with probability applications, or just dealing with ordered data. You know, it's something we're very familiar with, and we write queries for them every day. So currently, you know, how do we deal with ranges? You know, the, I think oh, the best way is to explain through an example. So let's say, you know, I, you know, I'm running a company, and you know, I have hourly workers, and I want to know when they're all coming into work, when they're clocking in, when they're clocking out. So I created this table, um, and you notice I have you no know, two columns, start time and end time, which are timestamps, because you know, naturally someone might be working from ten to two, or you know, six to eight. So if I want to figure out when someone is working, I could write a fairly straightforward SQL query. You know, you know employee 24 comes in. You know, I want to see if, you know, right now at 10.30 a.m. if employee 24 is on the clock. So we know that you know, the between and and uh, keywords enable you to uh, find you know, within a, you know, the range of whatever you're setting it in. Uh, let me try to explain that a bit better. So. Um, so if you notice here, you know, current time, if I'm seeing if the current time stamp is between the start time and the end time, um, that's the same thing as saying start time is less than or equal to the current time stamp, less than or equal to end time. You know, am I in the middle of the, the time range that I'm looking at? So naturally, you know, we're going to get the correct result from that. Actually, one little caveat I'll give with between and and, like I love it because it's a shortcut because normally you'll have to do, you know, uh, current time stamp greater than or equal to start time and current time stamp uh, less than or equal to end time. But sometimes you want, you know, you don't want that last time inclusive, uh, uh, particularly um, because, you know, let's say you do from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. If you do less than or equal to 3 p.m., you include everything at 3 p.m. as well, where you might actually just want up to 2.59, you know, in 59 seconds. So uh, that is one uh, caveat. How about, how about uh, when, it, when can I actually schedule this employee's shift? And I think it's pretty easy. I go to start doing it. I want to see, you know, if they already have um, uh, their employee schedule set up. So I start writing the query, and I realize, wait a second, you know, this is actually pretty complicated. You know, I just created one part that uh, could be overlapping in terms of a schedule conflict, but there's a lot more to that. And it's actually very easy to visualize. You know, if I'm looking for uh, when I'm actually overlapping in someone's schedule, there's four possible ways it could happen. It could either be it overlaps at one end, it overlaps at the other, completely overlaps, or it just it's within the actual schedule itself. So there's a lot of things you need to check for, and you know the sequel for writing that is not fun nor straightforward. So right now in, in Postgres 9.1, or should I say last week in Postgres 9.1, was there a built-in function to determine if ranges overlap? Nope. But perhaps I could have created a composite type and added some logics around it, and some logic around it, and made it easier to do. No, still pretty complicated. Maybe I could use a different database software, and you know they support some sort of range functionality. And to the best of my knowledge, you can't. I, I looked extensively. So I started hoping perhaps there's someone smarter than me that can make my problem easy. Because at the end of the day, you know I'm I'm a big database geek, but my you know. The way I, I make uh, money is by doing web development, so I don't have time to be futzing around with C, unfortunately. But it turns out uh, in November of last year that yes, uh, there were some very smart people who worked on range types, in, in particular one of them. And uh, uh, Magnus Hagander IM'd me the day it came out saying, look, you have range types, you know, they've been committed, uh, patch your version of 9.1. I'm like, ha, 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 no. But um, I've basically been waiting for uh, 9.2 to come out since then. So here's the cool thing. Uh, we have several built-in ranges that just, you know, right off the bat, you know, you load up Postgres 9.2, they're ready to go. We have uh, int4 ranges, uh, int8 ranges, numerical ranges, which is basically your set of real numbers. The, the last two are integers. Uh, timestamps, timestamps with time zones, and date ranges. 
and I could, Jeff, I could imagine the pain you had just dealing with the time data. I mean, that is not fun at all. So let's go back to a pre-calculus, because one of the important things to dealing with range types is you need to be able to read range notation. So first of all, how many, how many, how many people are com comfortable with math? Cool. That's, that's, why I love, that's why I love the database community. It's like, you know, you just gotta know everything. So, I mean, I, I don't, I don't want to like read out all the different notations, you know, one by one. But basically, you have a square bracket that's going to be less than or equal to. You have a, a, a parenthetical that's going to be a less than. So also know that we can have empty ranges too. So the other cool thing, I think, I think this is particularly cool, is that we can have infinite ranges. I mean, that's pretty powerful, especially you know when you, you know when you don't know when something's going to end or you don't know when something's going to begin. But there is one little catch, and I'm going to try to explain this as best as I can without being you know, too familiar with the internals. You can have infinite time ranges and date ranges, but there's a special keyword called infinity that you do not want to include in your ranges. Infinity has special meaning when you're dealing with a date and time manipulation. So just accept that for what it is, and you know, accept that, you know, just, you can even run this, you know, right now in your uh, 9 to expand prompt, and you'll see, you know, the first one is going to return true, the second one is going to return false. So how do we build a range? Well, um, let's use some Postgres syntax. You know, it's pretty simple. You know, I have a range from 1 to 10 inclusive. So, but you notice that when it outputs it on the command line, it's going to be 1 to 11 not inclusive. And uh, the reason I heard for that was because if you want to look at ranges in a row, you can basically uh, see uh, the overlapping sequences as you go down and you look at them. Does it make sense? Yes? Yeah. It's one of those things accepted for what it is as well. But, you know, I think it's, it'll pay off. You know, as you see more and more ranges put together, it will pay off. So date ranges, you know, nothing, no, I don't think I'm blowing anyone's mind here. Pretty easy. So of course, you know, complying with the SQL standard, you can use the normal, the normal constructor too. So one thing to note is that the constructor defaults to, uh, you know, a range with a, a non-inclusive non bound uh, on the right side. Um, again, that's because of the display purposes, I'm guessing. Right, Jeff? That's why it defaults. But you know you can easily adjust it uh, in the constructor. You know in the in the last uh, your last parameter you can say okay I want an inclusive timestamp range. So what sorts of operations do you get with dealing with ranges? Well you have your normal your normal you know equality operations. You know, are these ranges equal? Are they not equal? Is this range you know com you know less than this other range? Is it greater than? Um, Okay, see, so one, one of these is wrong, but I mean, I think you get the point that, you know, we have all these, you know, typical, you know, what I would expect when I'm dealing with, you know, if I was comparing one and three, you know, you're gonna get the same exact output, except, you know, we have an entire range, we don't have, you know, single numbers. But, you know, this is nothing too magical yet. You know, it's like, sure, okay, we have ranges, but what can you actually do with them? You know, this is, an, you know, why, why, why do I wanna have this all in one column, one data type, why, you know, I can still do all these things with two columns. So let's use an example. Um, let's say you're trying to shop for a car. You have a budget. You go to some uh, used, uh, you know, some used car site, and you, you want to see what they have available. So first, you know, we get to the site. Let's say we actually have access to their database because it's completely insecure, and they're running Postgres 9 too. You know, we want to see, you know, what, you know. Let's first order, you know, in terms of, you know, what, what is the, the price of the car? You know, what is, what is the cheapest possible deal I can get? So there's a function called lower, convenient name, that it'll take the lower bound of the range and you can manipulate that. Um, you know, it returns an integer, date type, et cetera, whatever, whatever your uh, primary data type is. So if you, if you see the order, you know, clearly, you know, this makes sense. It's ordered by the, the lowest number. There's also an upper function, so you can manip manipulate the upper bound as well. So car shopping is 
should be easy, right? You know, we know, we know what our range is, and you know, now we understand overlap. So, I mean, here, here's a concrete example of what an overlap would look like with some real numbers. So I know that, you know, I want to find something that should fit my range, should intersect with that red line. So our old method of writing the SQL, and this is actually the complicated way of doing it, is this works. This will find exactly the kind of car I want in my range. But you know, imagine the pain it took me to figure out this was actually the correct query. Uh, there's actually you know, just a, another fun point. There's actually a shorter way of doing this. So this query assumes that it checks for everything that's touching, uh, touching the red line. But you can actually do the opposite and say, okay, find everything that's not touching the red line, and once I know that, then I know everything that is touching the red line. And actually, uh, 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 halves this query. You just add a, you add a not to it. So, you know, I don't like doing that anymore, especially since I have the, the real power of range types at my disposal. So, as you see here, we're gonna introduce a new operator called the and and which is, means uh, overlaps. So using uh, my range constructor, I can now say, all right, you know, what, 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 whatever the car's price range is, let me and and that with my actual budget, and lo and behold, I have, you know, everything that overlaps with it. I mean, so we've basically taken this monster and compressed it to one line, which, you know, I don't know about you, I like writing less code, because it, it's less things that I can break. So, oh, I explained this already. All right, so we get the point of this. All right, so let's say, you know, I want to save some money on my car shopping, you know. I know what the, the lower end of my range is. I want to find everything that's like outside of my range, but like, you know, really cheap. I want to see where, what the real bargains are. That's where we have uh, the less than less than operator. Uh, I mean, it looks like a bitwise shift, but, you know, this is actually finding everything that's like completely out of my range, completely below, below what um, I'm looking for. And sure enough, you know, the logic holds. You know, everything uh, that's outputted is less than my range. Now let's say you know, I want to look at the, the really cheap cars, you know, the things that are heavily discounted. I'm sorry, Bruce. Yeah, that sounds like it's the same. Um, I think the difference is that this is one less step, and we're, we're going to talk about indexing a few slides from now, and you basically get the benefits of the gist index from using this operator. So uh, that said, here's, a, here's another new uh, operator. So I want to see, I want to see not only like the bargains, but I want to see things that are within my price range. So basically this does a partial, you know, overlap, and everything below what's uh, overlapping in my current range. So again, you know, as we look through the list, you know, the logic holds on that. So let's say, you know, you know, I, I'm dreaming of, you know, you know, owning a Lamborghini. You know, I want to see things that are, you know, completely, completely out of my budget. You know, to see what I can actually save towards. If you know, when I'm programming my website, the range, you know, the range type code works so efficiently that we make enough money I can afford one of these things. So that's where we have the greater than greater than operator, which does exactly that. So this one just, um, this is sort of a contrived example, but the idea is that you can also do range intersections. So basically, you know, I mean, we're familiar with intersections just from set theory. It's, you know, what, what's actually completely overlapping in, you know, this, you know, the finite window I'm looking at. So in this case, I, I guess the example I gave is, you know, I have like a limited negotiating window and, you know, you know, I want to find things that, you know, which cars are actually, you know, what, what prices can I actually look at, you know, within my intersection. Um, is everyone with me? I, I don't know. I don't think I'm explaining that one very well. Okay. So let me back up. So, so when I'm intersecting two ranges, I'm finding the exact overlap between them. So let's say I have a range of one to three and a range of two to four, and I do an intersection. The output of that's going to be two to three. Is that good? All right. So 
essentially I'm trying to do this now with my car shopping. That, all right, you know, there's a bunch of cars. My, you know, my price range is, you know, 13,000 to 15,000. What can I actually, you know, negotiate with based on their car inventory? So I perform that intersection and I know that, okay, if I want to get the Lincoln Continental, I'm between 13,000 and 14,000, you know, based on the intersection. I think in a real world negotiation, you would never do that. But again, this is why it's fictional. But yeah, do we feel good about intersections now? Okay. So, this is all fun and game, fun and good. But are these act, do these actually are they quick? You know, in the Um, yes, let's see. Correct. You're welcome. All right, so, are these fast? You know, in the web world, you care about speed. I also think you care about speed in every other, you know, area of software development. But, yeah, you know, when I, when I run and explain, you know, on my simple data set, okay, it's doing sequential scan. You know, I mean, when, when, if I only have 10 cars in my inventory, that's fine. But, you know, what if I have 100,000? And I, what if I have, you know, 100 people searching it per second? You know, things are going to be, you know, really bogged down. So the cool thing about uh, range types is that, you know, it's, they support gist indexing. So gist indices, if you're not familiar with them, basically allow you to extend uh, operations that are, are defined, basically new operations and allow you to get the full power of the, the Postgres indexing engine. So the great thing about, you know, the range types is because, you know, it, you know, it does interface with the gist index that we can actually run, you know, these very fast queries against our, our range types. So if I, you know, I, I expanded my, uh, my car data set and I, I forget how many I added. I think it was 100,000. And sure enough, when I tried to run the same query and I ran, an ex I ran the explain on it, I actually do hit the index. And uh, I do get a, a really fast result. So, let's uh, go to uh, another real world application, which is scheduling. How many people have had to write scheduling applications before? How many of you had to deal with double booking? How many of you have had to deal with just, you know, all the other nightmares associated with scheduling, just like things not working? Yeah. All right. So the nice thing is, you know, we could try using unique, con in, in the, well, let me, let me back up st a second. In the old world, we could try, you know, using exclusion constraints, unique constraints, but almost to no avail because we didn't really have that full overlap functionality in order to uh, properly, you know, for instance, book a room. So now let's use an exclusion constraint without the overlap operator on our, on our range. Um, you know, so I'm going to insert a few values. You know, bear with me. So you know, I have one trip between the seventh and the ninth, one trip between the twelfth and the seventeenth, and then I try to book one from the the thirteenth, uh, from the sixteenth to the eighteenth, which overlaps with the one from the the twelfth to the seventeenth. And lo and behold, I get a I get a warning saying, you know, you can't do that. You know, you're already traveling. You, know, you can't be in two places at once. Yes, because it's, um, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, the default would be equals. If you're doing an exclusion, no, I think no, with an exclusion constraint, you need to define your operator, regardless. Yeah. So, yeah, so in this case, you know, I, I'm choosing the overlap operator because, you know, I want to make sure I don't conflict, you know, I can't be in two places at once in, uh, in this uh, scenario. All right, so does it, everyone follow that? So when, when you define an exclusion constraint, you gotta make sure you include which operator you're excluding on or function or whatever uh, choice you make. So anyway, so the nice thing is, you know, at the database level, as opposed to at the application level, you can prevent, 
uh, bad data from being written. You can make sure that you don't have you know, overlapping double book rooms, airplanes, you name it, uh, you know, fr from occurring. Airplane seats, I should say. So this is pretty easy. Now, I'm, I'm just going to speak for a second from the real world. You know, so I have an application I'm, I'm going to talk about in a bit where you know, I, it involves room booking. And as much as I want to use this feature to prevent you know, bad, data for, beta, bad data from getting to the database, I may not be able to because there are instances where my clients are going to want to double book things for various reasons. So it's sort of like you know, every cloud has a silver lining, or in this case, every silver lining has a cloud. You know, I really, I, I really want to use this feature. Maybe I'll come up with a way of how I organize the columns so I can still you know, exclude, I guess, in a hacked way and make sure you know, there's not too much bad data written into it. But you know, it's sort of like at the end of the day, you know, you're beholden to your clients. So. As, as a typical uh, traveling salesperson, this is not all. Ranges can be extended. So we have you know, several built-in types already, but it's actually pretty easy to add some more. So actually, I was, I was kind of fascinated that um, you know, IP address ranges, you know, INET ranges were not automatically included because I figured, well, I mean, that's a you know, really obvious use of ranges. You know, I want to see if, you know, let's say you know, I'm a DHCP uh, a server. You know, I want to make sure there's no conflicts within my range. That's how that works. But, um, but lo and behold, I can just use the create type functionality and uh, indicate that's a range and choose the subtype. Um, so lo and behold, here's, a, here's another operator. I want to see, you know, is this IP address within a particular range? So uh, the less than and ampersand are, that means am I included in this? So sure enough, you know, if you look at the range values, you know, one of them is in it, one of them isn't. So basically, I just ex completely extended the functionality with you know, one line of SQL. That's pretty cool. So, so the subtype is specific to create type. And this is actually, so th the reason I like this example is that this is a really easy one. To actually extend some other things to ranges, you might need to do some more work, which will involve writing custom functions. Um, this actually explained in the documentation, and um, I was going to make the excuse I don't have time to go into it, but I think I'll have plenty of time to go into it. And so I'll use the other excuse, which is I'm not too familiar how to do it. It's a little bit more complicated, but you know, the good thing is sort of like using the gist indexes, that they're there. You can basically index anything, but you need to understand it, and understanding it is half the battle. So, range types in the wild. This is sort of a uh, to be happening, you know, within the next couple of weeks. But so the company I work for, Venue Book, you know, the main premise is that we're booking venues, we're booking spaces. You have a party, you need to book it. Now, there's a lot of fun part in that. You know, there's not only you know room reservation, but first you also got to find what kind of venue you want to book. And what does that involve? That involves having you know a number of guests. It involves having you know, you know, data availability, and it involves having a budget. So in a, the niceness of a user interface, we've actually encapsulated, you know, you only need to put in one number. You know, I have 40 guests, I have a budget of $2,000. But behind the scenes, it's actually a range because, you know, not everything fits, you know, nicely, you know, in a box like that. So what I actually do, you know, in the search I currently do with uh, Postgres 9.1, uh, I use that very long query I showed you earlier. You know, modified ad hoc to the, the purposes of my search. But now with range types, I can basically say, all right, $2,000. You know, maybe they want to see something between $1,000 and $3,000. Right, map that to a range type. I have all, you know, I have budget ranges for all my venues in range types. I do an overlap operator. It returns quickly. Done. I mean, I basically save, you know, days of programming and put it, I mean, not days, but, you know, hours and hours of programming and, you know, I've now I brought it down to maybe you know, a 30 minute exercise, which includes proper testing and uh, making sure the users get the results they want. So this is cool. I mean, this is gonna be live within the next month, you know, using this, this brand new feature. And I invite you all to try and break it and see, uh, test my programming. So for more information, there is a lot of documentation. So the first one basically explains how the range data type works. 
The second one explains all the functions. The third one is for extending the range types, which is basically from the create type documentation and explains to you what I can't explain right now in words, which is how do you actually uh, extend a, a range type that's a bit more complicated than uh, an IP address. And finally, uh, there's a wiki, which I think is still, I think it basically explains the process in which um, the range types are developed and what they're used for. I had that link up there because I, I was actually giving this talk before range types uh, were, uh, well, I'm sorry, before uh, Postgres 9.2 came out. So, in conclusion, it's, a, it's actually not that long a talk you know, once you get down to it, but you know, if you're not completely smitten by these things, then I'm sorry, I feel that explaining them because I think they're revolutionary, and I hope you do too because you know, once you do come across a problem that involves a range, you're gonna be like, oh, great, thank you. Thank you. There's so many, you know, easy, you know, functions available just to figure out, you know, how to solve this problem. And of course, you know, if you haven't upgraded to Postgres 9.2, you need to do that to use this feature. So, upgrade soon. Um, I know there's a bug. Uh, I think some people might say it's a bad bug that's being fixed. I think Monday. Or it's gonna go up on Monday. Yes, 14. Okay. So. Oh, really? Okay, so keep an eye out for, uh, so make sure the next release that comes out, which should be by Monday, upgrade uh, your 9.1s and your 9.2s to the, the latest uh, release. So uh, thanks, Jeff. Uh, I've been, I, like personally, I've been eagerly anticipating this feature, but uh, Jeff offered this. So I, I would, like honestly, I would thank him for this, like with applause. It's pretty cool. And also thanks to, uh, Alexander Krotkov for the gist improvements, which you know allow us to have these really fast searches. So if you have any questions, want to throw things at me, etc., this is my contact info. And uh, yeah, let's start. Sure. There's a school of thought uh, in numerical analysis that says individual data points should be represented with ranges. And I'm just wondering, and that's in other words, you, you have an interval of a sample interval. You don't really know anything at a particular point. You just kind of know it, it, ha it, it happened within this window. And you can just rewrite all the rules, I mean all the algorithms in numerical analysis using this. Uh, I'm wondering if, what I, if, range, if you think the range types can handle kind of that higher level of query. Well, give, give us an idea of the, of the volume, because you get a lot of complexity in the overlapping relationships of things, and especially with the exclusion. Can you handle tens of millions of, say, sample points that are represented as ranges? So I know it started at this point in time and ended at this point in time, but I don't know exactly where, so I just represent the sample as a range instead of an individual point in time. Okay, I mean, how, how specifically how are, you, you know, are you querying inside them? You, do you care about what's inside it at all, or do you just care about, you know, the bound, I have a range that's this big, and I have, you know, the bounds, you know, at these ends? Well, I'm just, I'm just kind of brainstorming here. I'm just saying, give us an idea of the kind of volume you think. Have you, have you done any prototyping with, say, tens of millions of overlapping intervals? So I haven't, I haven't worked on anything to that scale. Um, I'm gonna ask Jeff because I know I'm sure Jeff uh, has done some serious benchmarks. All right, so just to repeat for the mic, uh, the long story short is that it depends on the types of queries and the types of problems you're solving. If it's more complicated, you know, you need to evaluate what type, you know, basically what you're trying to get out of it and, you know, base your queries on that. I think just to speak from a pure volume perspective, I mean, Postgres, you know, you know, if, if you use Postgres right, it is very scalable, you know, to use our favorite buzzword. Um, you know, and it's really, you know, how, it's basically, you know, how, how do you use your indices, how do you, you know, 
what hardware are you actually running Postgres on, et cetera? You know, how, how do you break up your table? How do you break up your data? Hi. Uh, Hi. I'm interested in the performance comparison using the range types to what you had used previously. You would have two columns, and you'd have an index on each. So, so you wrote this website, and you had pri prior versions. I assume that you have like some performance comparison. All right. So I, you know, I haven't fully implemented range types in the the current version of the website. Uh, my expectation is that it should be more efficient, just in terms. Of if I just think of it from an I/O perspective, um, if I have, you know, let's say I have one index as opposed to two when I'm doing my lookup. You know, I'm only I only have to go through one, you know, one index tree. So you know, my read my read should be faster as a result of that. Um, of course, you would say, well, there's underlying logic too. There's more underlying logic with a range type than necessarily with MySQL. But um, at the end of the day, you know, in some ways, it's equivalent. I'm doing, you know, you know, uh, in, in my overlap, I think it's like 19 operations in my in my current implementation. And while I'm only doing one operation technically when I'm uh, overlap uh, doing a range type overlap, I'm still, you know, that's still that operator is encapsulating a lot of logic there. Um, I would actually love to do a follow-up to this talk, which is, all right, you know, I've run them in the wild. Let's see, you know, let's see how it goes. Um, and perhaps that'll be something like I'll tweet out, I'll blog about, I'll find some way of communicating, you know, you know, the, the full result of it. But I, I'll just say, just from my early experimentation, you know, I did put in you know, some serious data, and it returned pretty quickly, and it returned you know just as fast, if not faster than you know, the old method. So I have a lot of data where there's sort of a begin and an end. Is and and my first inclination is to think, hey, I'll just make those a range type. Is there any reason why I don't want to use that in, in those kinds of circumstances? I feel like these are all sort of the same question sure. together. So okay, yeah. and I think I think that's a good question. And by the way, you know, people, if people want to chime in, feel free. You know, I like you know one of the things I love doing when I give talks is just turning them into a discussion, especially when it's a new features. So I'll give you reasons why not to use range types. So this is a good example. Let's say I really only care about the beginning and the end of my range, and I don't care about stuff in between. Well, you know, if I'm constantly accessing the beginning and the end, I'm going to have to use the lower and the upper function, which means I have to pay a penalty from calling a function. So if, I, if I'm doing queries over that constantly, well, then I probably have to write it, you know, I, I would want a functional index on that, which then I have to pay the penalty of creating a functional index and, you know, maintaining that. And, you know, and by, when I say maintaining, basically the, know, uh, Postgres maintaining the updates, the deletes, the inserts, et cetera. So in that case, you know, maybe I would prefer to use two columns. It just, you know, I, you know, ultimately I would have to benchmark it to see what would happen. But I feel like if, if I'm not using, you know, any of the range type operators, I probably don't need range types in that, in that regard. Is there an overlap with the post GIS operators doing the same thing for uh, geographic ranges? Include, you know, it's inclusion, exclusion, point and range, that type of thing. Are the, are the operators the same overloaded operators? That is a good question. I don't know off the top of my head. I think, you know, the one thing I think the Postgres community has tried to do is keep the the operators standard, so that you know, when you when you have different data types, that, for instance, uh, the less than and at sign, which is the include. Basically, am I included in this range? I know that's the same as a point being included in, in a region. Or, a, a, you know, basically the geometric types in Postgres would do the same exact things. Like, is this square included in this square? Um, to that specific question, I would have to look it up. But, yeah, I, I don't want to give you the wrong answer. Have you had to deal with um, tables with time ranges that are being time partitioned? Yes, once upon a time, uh, when I had to deal with TV schedule data. This was, I think, what version of Postgres is it? It might have been 8.1 or 8.2. So how did you deal with the partitioning um, and the ranges? OK, so it was actually, I would say it was actually a very messy solution, given uh, the tools uh, we had at the time. So for, for one thing, uh, when we did uh, the table partitioning, uh, we used, um, basically, you know, there, there's Let's call it a formula or an algorithm for setting up uh, table partitioning. You know, we followed the formula and said, okay, you know, we want our TV schedule data for August to be in this table, you know, using all the rules and you know, the, basically the method of setting up partitioning. You know, so we want August here, we want September here, we want October here. 
The long story short was that it was messy because we constantly had to uh, keep creating new tables, new rules, updating the database. And the other thing, uh, if anyone has anyone ever played like the Tribune Media Services data or like TV data? Okay, so it changes constantly. You basically get a two week snapshot of everything coming up on TV and anything in those two weeks can change. So you have to get it every day, re-update it, and it's like a long, painful process. So why am, I, why am I saying that? Because not only are we dealing with you know, messy data coming in, but we have to maintain this messy schema in order to partition it. So I guess you know, to, to get at what Josh is getting at, you know, can range types you know, s you know, make this problem easier? I think in terms of the overlap, absolutely. Um, I think you know, the nice thing about, let's say for the instance of TV data, is that you know things are gonna run on, a, we were basically doing it by month, so we could segment it by date. And like a date range is much easier to deal with than a time range. Because if you think about it, a date range is discrete. You have, you know, you know it's uh, the 17th, the 18th, the 19th. Time is continuous. I mean, which sounds, you know, like some sort of transcendental thing, but, you know, it's going on and on, and, you know, you don't, you don't really have, you know, breakpoints in it. So part of the, your partitioning strategy should be, you know, what is, you know, you first, you should ask yourself, what is the easiest way to partition? Like, do I have, absolutely have to partition by time? Because there's a lot of cases where you don't have to. You know, you could find, you know, perhaps you can do it by your, your primary key. Perhaps you can do it by, you know, some other, you know, an, an enumerated type in your database. But there's some times, like with, you know, TV data, that you might have to do it by time. You know, if our, you know, our database at that, you know, when I was working on that database, it wasn't too large. It was, you know, how many gigabytes, but let's say 50 gigabytes. So it was still manageable, but I mean, you know, if I stayed in that business, you know, perhaps I would be dealing with you know, four terabytes of data by now, and you know, that, that strategy I don't think would work so well. And I might actually have to say like, okay, we need to have a partition today just for you know, month, uh, Tuesday the, the 18th. I think, you know, and then you know, I definitely see range types being much more, in fact, imperative to use in that case. I, lo I, lo I love how you know you know questions you get more questions you know this is what's this is also why I love this talk because it is a very short talk but suddenly it's like it's good yeah so I waited till nobody was at the microphone so I you know I could I obviously overused my quota during the thing but obviously now I have a whole bunch of questions <laughs> so you know that's right. what it's that's what it's like so Go. so last week uh, I gave a talk about the nine two features to the Philly user group. And Josh Burkus did the same thing for San Francisco. Um, and, and in a month, you'll be doing it in New York. And I'll be doing it in New York. And when we got to, to range types as, as a feature, the only thing I could say was Michael Glazeman, who was in the audience, is super excited about them. But I don't understand them well enough. So all I know is they're tremendously exciting. And once I understand them, I know I'll be excited. But right now, I have to take Glazeman's word for it, right? And what I got from this talk was actually kind of pulling the covers away from something that was super powerful. As you said, when you had it up there, you said, if you're not excited about this feature, I didn't explain it, right? Like, and seriously, like I, will, I will like hang my head in shame. Like right, this. Because, because like other things we've brought in, like full text search and writable CPs and like window functions, it's sort of a yeah, to use your word, transcendental type of change to the way you think of things. And it takes a while to really wrap your head, or it needs a presentation to really wrap your head around it. Um, I know I didn't f understand full text search until I heard Oleg and Piotr give a presentation at PG Open about full text search. And before then, I was just completely lost about what this thing was. But, you know, 40 minutes of them explaining it in Russian English was enough for me to, to get it, you know, and then I was able to, to kind of embrace it and understand where it was going. And this is really what this did for me. So I guess my first question is, are the slides available online? Was that yes. one of the web things you had up? Or? Yes, okay. um, I'll, I'll tweet it out. Okay. Um, this one. The second thing was when you had your slide up about the application you're writing and you talked about the, 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 the cost being a range well, I guess I also the number of attendees is a range too, which I hadn't yeah. really realized, but it's a range because the room will take between you know, 20 and 50 and 
You're not going to put five people in a room for 5,000. So there's kind of a logical range. So I, I'm starting to see more ranges, I guess, and I'm, you're probably doing that too. You now see ranges that you didn't see before. Um, in fact, even when this gentleman was talking about measurements, usually, you know, as I think as you were really implying, measurements are really not discrete. You know, when something's 72 degrees, it's really not 72 degrees, right? It's, it's 70 degrees plus and minus whatever the, 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 the precision uh, is of that instrument. And the idea that we can now express that in the database and now do queries without sort of mucking up artificially mucking up what we're doing, which is usually the way we usually do it, uh, really brings a whole new, you know, aside from scheduling, in terms of measurement, it also brings a whole new thing. So I, I was just, that the, I'm starting to now see the light of what, of why this is so exciting. That I didn't really understand. I know it's wonderful, but I hadn't really gotten it, you know, until, until this and really sort of see how it changes the way we think about problems in, in, in a way that I hadn't, you know, I think you know with the the the, the performance you know the basically the performance uh, enhancements on the range type the indexing could definitely help with that and you know just using just a lot of the features in like nine two just you know were focused on performance like you know I know one of the big things being promoted is that you know you can run Postgres on sixty four cores now and get I think uh, three hundred thousand transactions per second so you know we have that level of computational power to you know deal with you know tens of millions of rows just you know on a single node. I know even in, uh, you know, for instance, in the pharmaceutical world, when you're just, you know, taking measurements on, you know, if you're doing a clinical, uh, clinical trial and you're taking measurements, you know, there's always a, an error bound in that. So basically you could have your measurement and essentially, you know, the range outside of it that, you know, it could be, you know, within this window. And it'd be interesting to see, you know, what applications, you know, you could derive, you know, from using this feature and that, you know, if it, if it uh, helps. Yeah, I mean, the way you usually fix the range problem is you, when you do your query, you, instead of checking for 72, you check for, you know, 71.5 to 72.5. So your constant ends up moving around, but that assumes that all the values in, the co in that column have the same variability, right, the same precision, which is not true, right, because you might be measuring one thing with one instrument that has one precision and something else with another instrument that has a different range of precision. That's impossible to do with that range, without range types because there's no way to represent the range unless you add a precision as a separate column and try and work that into some very complicated, you know, uh, something. Um, so, and the other thing is that uh, Alexander Karkoff is the, he's, he's been really, uh, he's been attending a lot of our conferences. I know he'd probably be in Prague, but he was in Amsterdam last year. He's been working very hard on performance. So we do have somebody who's really got his head in this in, in, from performance angle. Uh, so if there's anything that isn't working fast, I think we have at least a resource to, to go to. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. So just uh, two quick comments on what Bruce said, the one of them I just forgot. Uh, the writable CTEs, by the way, which is one of the features he mentioned, I used, it's actually amazing. Like I had a, a really messy delete I needed where I need to like 
figure out the data in like multiple table, uh, multiple tables, and then put it into the, in the delete. And of course, you know the delete syntax is kind of hard to deal with, like joins, and you know, in order to, in order to delete your data accurately, because of course you can only delete from, you know, one table at a time. But with a writable CTE, you can actually delete from multiple tables at a time, and then get to your final delete. So, for instance, if you have you know foreign keys, um, and you know, of course, you know you're dependent on you know data, I guess you know, data being in its appropriate place before deleting it. Uh, with a writable CTE, you can just like do a cascading delete, which is pretty cool. Or you can always do like I think oh, there, there's no is there a delete cascade? I think I know there's a truncate cascade, which like you should never run unless you know what you're doing. Um, it gets suddenly like for those of you who don't know what that is, um, truncate is a way to quickly delete a table, and truncate cascade is a really quick way to delete your entire database if you're not careful. I think um, any more questions? We have we have a few more minutes. Sure. Um, so you were talking about where not to use range types, mm -hmm. and typically it'd be situations where you've got the beginning and the end already modeled. And you mentioned you were migrating. Have you played around with actually having your beginning and end defined as columns, and then using a function to build your range type on top of existing data? Um, So actually, I'm going to answer this in an interesting way. So you know, a lot of the work I have to do. So you know, I program in Python. So at the end of the day, I need to map. You know, whatever I do in the database, I need to make sure I map it to like a native Python type, at least for the ease of use for you know the rest of my developers, which right now is 80% of the time me. Um, so in that regard, I actually do have some mapping between you know my Python types and Python range types. Um, so when I do the data, when I do the migration, when I actually run the, the full migration for the database, I mean, what I'll do, it, it's, it's probably gonna be fairly non-trivial. It'll just be something like, you know, I'll just take the two columns and then plug them into the, the range type constructor and add it that way. So for the, for the stuff you're doing, you wouldn't necessarily need both. No, in fact, I, I'm looking, I'm, I'm gonna have both in the beginning, just as my, uh, my uh, backup. Right. Uh, I think I'll, I'll gradually phase that out. But so you're doing that through code, just the migrate from one to the other as opposed yeah. to and then types. and then I'll, I'll probably just you know whenever I insert data, I'll probably as opposed to inserting to my two uh, let's say my two uh, budget columns and my one range type, you know instead of an either or, I'll just insert to all three. Right. And then when I'm completely ready to like completely axe the other two, I'll do it. The nice thing about having a relatively you know a relatively low load is that you can mess around with things like that and see what actually works. Thank you. Low production load. Oh, so the, the other thing I'd like to mention, and we have one minute. I don't think Jeff can explain this in a minute, but uh, Jeff, a question for you. So when, when, I, when I took math, you know, I learned that you know, when you're dealing with real numbers or you know, I guess numeric types, that you, know, you, you don't know how many numbers are in between two real numbers. You know, it's just mathematically impossible. So I'm curious you know, how hard was it to like, deal with you know, numeric types and a time series and just deal with infinite range. Please. Sorry, this is like my personal fascination. I hope yeah, you don't yeah. mind. So conceptually, it, it kind of took a while to uh, work through um, the the details between uh, what I call discrete ranges and continuous ranges, which are discrete ranges are things like integers, right? So there's you know uh, if you have a range of integers and the bounds are finite, uh, then you have a finite number of points. Um, but that, like you said, is not true for numeric. So it took me a while to come up with uh, some kind of way to reconcile those two in a way that makes sense. Um, so uh, what I'll what uh, we ultimately came up with uh, was uh, you know kind of a, a concept of um, you know a a uh, function that's associated with the range type that can kind of canonicalize it. And so with like an integer range, you know, open uh, or um, open one to open 10 is the same as close two to close nine. Um, but that's not true for numeric. Um, so through this kind of what I call the canonicalization function, uh, uh, we were able to kind of reconcile that. And that was after quite a bit of discussion in the community. Um, so yeah. Cool. All right, so I think uh, we're out of time. Uh, so thank you. If there are any questions, you know, please feel free to ask.
Yes, there will be.